good morning. Welcome. So glad that you're here in both rooms. Really glad that you're here, especially if you're on the new end of the continuum. Really glad you came over. So why don't you turn in your Bibles? We're going to go to uh, Matthew <clears throat> chapter 6 in just a moment. And if you didn't bring a Bible, uh, why don't you wave at one of the ushers? Right now, they're coming in both rooms. They'll be glad to let you borrow one. And if you don't own one, you can keep it. This is our gift to you. So uh, we'll go to Matthew chapter 6 in just a few moments. Just to remind you, last week, Pastor Dan got us going in a great new <clears throat> series that we're calling The Things That Keep Me Up at Night. He was talking about worry. And if you didn't listen to that one, I hope you'll go back and listen to it. But he pointed out in that message that the root of worry is the quest for control. That's what's at the root of worry, is our quest for control. We want to be in control. But in most every aspect in life, we're not in control. The healthiest and most disciplined eater and exerciser, sometimes he or she gets cancer. The hardworking, loyal employee, sometimes they get laid off. The most careful driver, can still be caught in a terrible accident, not caused by him or herself, but by the other person. The most committed, prayerful, loving moms and dads will still carry the heartaches and the headaches of their children. Even devout, Jesus-loving followers Christians, as we saw in Sri Lanka on Easter, can be attacked and martyred in mere seconds. And so as much as you and I wish that we could be in control of everything that's going on around us, the older you get, the more in touch with reality you grow, the more you come to realize, I don't think I really control a whole lot after all. So what do we do? We worry. <laughs> That's what we do. And Jesus, knowing how worry touches the nerve of everyday life, embedded several pivotal teachings about it smack dab into the center of the greatest sermon known, the Sermon on the Mount. It's found in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And if you haven't connected the dots yet... Um, that's actually the portion of Scripture, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, that we've been working our way through in this first half of 2019. Um, <clears throat> so before uh, we turn and look at the passage that we're going to look at today in Matthew 6, let me ask you, do you know what consistently is found to be at the top of people's lists of wor worries in survey after survey? You know what it is? Money, yes. We worry about, do I have enough? Am I going to be able to pay for this? What about my debt? What do I do about savings? Once you have kids, what do I do about the college funds? Will I be able to retire someday? There's all facets of the money issue that people consistently say, I, really, I, I worry a lot about this. So many things that even those of us who are reasonably skilled and effective at managing money, we can find ourselves somewhat unexpectedly caught up in the, in the clutches of worry uh, ourselves. Just this past week, I had that experience. I was going through the mail and came upon an envelope, uh, and I opened it up and began to read, and it was from... Uh, an insurance company that I had purchased the term life insurance from 14 years ago when we were getting ready to have Wesley. And since it's a 20-year term, they just always seem to like to send me these reminders that the clock is ticking and you run out in six years. So if you want the prize, 
you got a check out in the next six years. But you know, that doesn't feel like much of a prize. And so they were saying, or what you could do is get another policy and we can add on, you know, and, and on and on. And, and so then that got me thinking, oh, you know, this isn't my only, I got another couple of, but this is the biggest one. And goodness gracious, should I get another one? And, and but gosh, once, <laughs> once you have a stint in your LAD artery, the insurance companies, when they find that part out, they, they don't come to you with quite as much love as they once did. And, and so I'm thinking, well, in, in that case, it would probably cost a fortune to get another one. And why do they send me these letters? And it just ruined my day. And so I had to take a deep breath and went to my study to begin working on this sermon. Which, of all things, was on the worries of money. So, uh, that's where we're going. I want to share with you the verses that I've been studying this week and some insights that I've had from them. So, let's start in Matthew chapter 6, and we'll pick it up in verse 19. So Jesus says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. And then the light within and then the light within you is darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Verse 24, no one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, verse 25, I tell you, do not worry about your life and what you'll eat and what you'll drink and about your body and what you'll wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Verse 27, can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And verse 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given unto you. Now, at first glance, when you read all of this section together, it can seem a bit like Jesus is bouncing all over the place. But he's not. He's really just hitting the very same topic from several different angles. And you'll see this in the next few minutes, I believe. And, and then at the end, he sort of lassos them all up and draws them back to this conversation that we're having about worry, about anxiety, about the things that keep us up at night. And he's going to tell us, hey, there is a freedom that you can have from all of it that only the Father can provide to you. So if our hearts and minds grow consumed with possessions, with stuff, with money, by its very nature, here's what's going to happen. Jesus is telling you there's three things that are going to happen, and you better watch out for these three things. So if you're a note taker, here they are. It's going to mess with your values. Secondly, it's going to mess with your perspective. And thirdly, it's going to mess with your integrity. You're saying, I don't believe I saw that in any of this. Well, you're going to in the next few minutes. Let's look again. First, it's going to mess with your values. Deep in our hearts, we hear this nagging voice saying to us, here's how you could finally have control in an uncontrollable world. Here's how you could be safe. In this dangerous life. Here's how you can have control no matter what. You just need to get some more stuff. Get some more money and save up some more money and, and invest some more. And Jesus is saying, wrong. If you're clinging to money, it's only a matter of time until you're going to be surprised and disappointed. Why? Simple. Because he says all these things that you've stashed and stored up 
over time, they're going to they're gonna wear out, they're going to break, they're going to get stolen by thieves, or they're going to get nibbled on by moths or vermin. And, the, and especially if they're nice clothes, and that's something that the people of 2,000 years ago were just as familiar with as they are today, as we are today. He's saying, so, so, so why would you become a prepper? He's saying that. You haven't thought about it that way. But he is. And now I'm not saying when I talk about being a prepper, I'm not saying that you have become uh, one of those extremists that moves up to Montana and hunkers down and, and stashes away endless shelves of non-perishable food and water and all of these things just waiting for the great nuclear bomb to come someday. But what he is saying is from God's perspective, you have to see this, from God's perspective, all of us are acting like preppers. When we run around frenetically like our hair's on fire trying to figure out how can I get a few more of those and I need some of those and I, it wouldn't be bad to have one of those too and, and I better get all of these sorts of things. He's saying think about it. Preppers, they're stashing up and storing the food and water for the great nuclear bomb but he's saying to us, us suburbanites, you, you're no less plagued by this tendency. We hear nuclear bomb and we think, I need a new outfit. And Macy's has a sale, you know, and because I don't have anything to wear. And, and so what do we do? We go out and we get some more stuff. He's saying that is exactly what you do. You're just stashing up and storing up different things. So you're a prepper, he's saying. All of us have this inner tendency to do that. He says, and I'll tell you, it shows me what you value. It shows me that you're convinced that you could really take better care of yourself than I could. It shows me that you value all the steps that you could take more than you value putting your trust in me. He says, but that doesn't make sense, does it? In, in your heart, just, just think about it. Your heart is telling me everything Jesus is saying. Your, 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 <laughs> your stuff is never going to sustain you. Think about it. Who am I, Jesus is saying. I am the one who came into this world to live the sinless life of perfection that you could never live. I am the one who therefore qualified to die the death of punishment in your behalf so that you wouldn't have to be punished for your sin. I'm the one who rose from the dead and conquered the grave that you're so terrified of. And that's why you keep trying to get more stuff. You're trying to push it off. You're trying to stay in control. But you can't stay in control. I'm the one who came to save you. And so he's saying, why then do you do that? Why do we continue to do that? I'll tell you why. Because our hearts grow more convinced that the stuff of this world could sustain us better than he could. We believe this because we've been told it our whole life. We've been infected with this thinking. And Jesus is saying, meanwhile, <laughs> you could be feeling such freedom. And you could be storing up nonetheless. You could just be storing it in a fail-safe bank. You could be putting it in the fail-safe fund of heaven. If you were just to let go of it and give it to my people who are in need. That's credited to your account, and I'll keep it there someday for you. That's why he's saying in verse 20, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. There's no moths. There's no vermin. There's no thieves. Not in heaven. Every investment you put in the bank of heaven will be kept safe there. He illustrates this, Jesus does, not in this passage, but in another well-worn passage in Luke chapter 12. You remember the story of the rich fool? 
There's a story parable that Jesus told of this man whose ground yielded a bountiful crop. And so as they were harvesting the crop, they put it all into the barns and filled up the barns and there was still more to come. And so, Jesus, uh, so, so the man said, what am I going to do with all this stuff? He said, I know what I'll do. I'm going to tear down my current barns and I'll build even bigger barns and I'll stuff those full. And finally, when I filled all of those bigger barns up to the brim, I'll be able to sit back and eat, drink, and be merry. Jesus says, that night, God said to that man, you fool, tonight, your life's going to be required of you. It's all over tonight. And then, what will you have? It's a sobering picture that Jesus gave to us of exactly what he's talking about here. He's saying it's sad, it's pathetic. That that, that that man was so devoured by his stuff that he, he couldn't see outside himself. He couldn't see that he was really bankrupt, even though he had so much. Because his value system had gotten totally distorted. Now, how about you? How are you doing about that? Are you clutching onto the things convinced I, I just, it'll make me feel a little bit better if I can just get a little bit more? Or have you taken him at his word when he says, why don't you send it on ahead? Put it in your heavenly account and let me use it for my people who are in need here and now. How are you doing on that? Jesus is saying, your heart says everything. Your heart is always going to follow your treasure. So you go out and buy a new one of those and a new shiny one of that, and you, your, your heart will get excited. I know. Mine does too. I know that feeling. But Jesus is saying, but the same principle is true. Try it. He said, if you would give some of what I've entrusted to you to, to the people who run the orphanage that he's been whispering to you about. He said, why don't you give some to them? They need it. Because those children, they don't have what you have and what your children have. You, you give some of your treasure there and your heart will follow and you'll grow interest and you'll want to know what's going on down there. Or you give some money to, to support a missionary or to some people that are going to dig water wells in third world countries. And what happens? Your heart gets excited about that. And you start to want, wonder, well, how, how did it go? And do, did you get water? And do, what were the responses of the people in the village? And, and you have a sense of part of me is there. That's what Jesus was saying. Your heart follows your treasure. It's not an indictment or a value assessment. It's just reality. Our hearts always follow treasure. So what you do with your stuff says everything about what you value most, your values. Second, he's pointing out our stuff can really distort our perspective. Can really distort our perspective. You see this in the verses 22 through 24 where Jesus talks about the eyes and he says all that stuff about the eyes and the darkness. And what he's saying here, quite simply, is that our stuff can cause a blindness to our eyes that makes our souls grow dark within. It blinds us to how much we really have. You know why we so easily get blinded by the stuff that we have? I'll tell you why. Because there's something in the heart of humans that compels us to compare ourselves not with people who have less than we, but compels us to compare to those who have more. That's always what we do, isn't it? And so we find ourselves, the devil just loves to get in our thoughts and get us thinking, you know, you need to look at your neighbor in the house that's a little bit nicer than your house. And the one, you know, who just got the new granite, uh, you know, countertops that you don't have, you know, and, and you start thinking about that. Or, or the one whose sta staircase has the banister with those, those really cool, you know, spindles that, that 
your stairs don't have that, you know, or, or the one that has a pool and you don't have a pool. Or if you do have a pool, the one that has a pool and a spa. And if you have a pool and a spa, you, you look at the people who have the outdoor kitchen. And, and we just keep going up, don't we? We never compare to the people who have less. We always compare up. And this is what can really begin to mess with our perspective. Jesus is saying this is a dangerous thing and I want you to see it because over time what happens is you grow consumed with your stuff. Your eyes start to close to spiritual things and your eyes closing, spiritually speaking, are like the curtains of your soul being drawn closed and there's darkness in that person's soul. John Wesley was a, a famous um, well, hero of mine, who's an evangelist and a pastor in the 1700s in England, and <clears throat> would lead thousands of people to, to know Christ in the course of his uh, lifetime. The story is told of something that happened to him, though, that left quite an impression. Before he was uh, 28, he was uh, at Oxford, and he had a situation that would forever change the trajectory of how he handled his stuff. Stories told about while he was there at Oxford, he was decorating his room and he'd gone out and got some art and, and got the art pieces up on the walls of his room. And just as he had finished paying for those pictures and getting hung on the room, uh, uh, on the wall of his room, walls of his room, a cleaning lady, the cleaning lady came uh, to his door. And it was a cold winter day, and he noticed that she had nothing to protect herself from the elements beyond the thin linen gown that she was wearing. And so he reached into his pocket to give her some money so that she might be able to buy something that would keep her a little bit warmer. And he discovered he had nothing left. And instantly, it was like the smelling salts. had. It was like the baseball bat had just clobbered him. And he had this, this sense of awakening uh, that, that what, have I, what am I doing? As if God cares more about my art pieces than this woman who could really use my help. He asked himself, will someday the Lord say to me, well done, good and faithful steward. Thou hast adorned thy walls with the money which could have warmed this poor lady from the cold. And that was a pivotal moment it jolted him served as a reality check and cleared up his perspective and forever changed his trajectory and sure enough you study the life of wesley and for the better part of 60 years thereafter he would live and he would minister and he would make money he would make money because he wrote many books and he would get honoraria for uh, wherever he would go and the, the, and so by English standards of the 1700s, John Wesley actually became a very wealthy person, but you would never know it because he just continued to live on 28 to 30 pounds a year, which he'd been living on when he was 28 years old. And the rest he would just give away. He would just say, I just wanted to go into the heavenly account. There's not much use in my stashing it up and storing it up here anyhow. Put it in the heavenly account and let it be used for some other people who have greater needs than I. So stuff reve reveals what we value and it really distorts our perspective if we're not careful. It also severs our integrity. Now you remember, that's a, that's a word that we tend to instantly think, oh, character and, and honesty when we think of integrity. And, and that is right in the way the word is used today, but I'm not using it so much there, nor am I inferring that if you have money, that therefore you don't have integrity or that you don't have honesty. No, that's, that's not it. But what I'm meaning here is that the root word from which we get integrity is the word integer. And do you remember from your math days what an integer is? An integer is a whole number. It's not a fraction. And, and so what, what we're learning here is that Jesus is saying the person with integrity is someone who has 
integrated the whole of their life into one. They're not being pulled in different directions. And this is exactly what he's talking about when he's saying you can't serve two masters at the same time. And instantly people in his day and age, uh, uh, several thousand years ago, would have envisioned this whole pulling apart thing in a way that we would miss but instantly their minds would have gone to the very, very graphic concept of a well-known torture device used in those days where they would take a person and they would tie uh, one side of him to a horse on this side and they would tie another uh, side of him to the horse on the other side and then they would slap the rump of both horses and the horses would start to pull until that person was violently torn apart. Now, I'm sorry, that's a little bit graphic. I probably shouldn't have told you. This will be R right here. But, but, but this is the kind of picture that Jesus was communicating which they would have gotten instantly when he said, you can't go in two different directions at the same time. It is going to pull you apart. It's going to sever you. It will disintegrate you. Because your soul can't go two directions in the same time. That's why he says in verse uh, 24, no one can serve two masters. Verse 26, you can't serve God and money. If you try and do that, it's going to tear you apart at the seams. Now, to be clear, the problem for, for many of us, maybe even most of us, who, if you've trusted in Christ, I'm talking particularly to you, I'm not meaning to exclude anybody who hasn't said yes to Jesus, I'm glad you're here. And I know some of you are here because you took the challenge two weeks ago and said, I'm giving this a try, just like a lady that I met after the first service. Um, so I'm not intentionally ex excluding you, but I do want to say something to those of you who have stepped across the line of faith uh, about this being severed apart thing. The problem for you and for me is not that we might uh, have to decide if we're going to belong to the Lord. No. If you've stepped across the line of faith, you have tethered yourself to him. You have tied yourself to Christ. You have stepped into the good news, into the gospel that he offers. You've stepped into life. The real question isn't whether you're going to do that because you already did that. The real question is will you continue to turn in the direction of the source of life into which you've already been born? And will you function in the fullness of those resources made available to you by him? Or will you, while somehow trying to stay tethered to him, say, but I'm also going to hedge over here. And I'm going to tether myself to the things of this world. Because somehow if I just had a little bit more of them, I think I'd feel better and safer and fuller and more complete and happier. That's really what the question is, as if that could save you. He says, you'll never survive that. He said, I created you to be integrated as one person that I'm right in the middle of. And I'm in the middle of every aspect of your life, including this aspect, which you're very frightened of. Like the survey say, oftentimes more than any other aspect, the money aspect. But we try this thing, don't we? And you know what the, the result is? Worry. It's the stuff that keeps us up at night. That's the result of it. Worrying about our status. Worrying about whether we have enough, worrying about our house, worrying about our wheels, worrying about our threads, worrying about whether we're measuring up, worrying about whether you've saved enough or you bought enough life insurance. Or... And Jesus says, no wonder you're so frazzled. No wonder you're so torn apart. You're trying to serve two masters at the same time. You're disintegrated. So he says in verse 25, do not worry about your life, 
what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, about your body, what you're going to wear. Because is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? So maybe an hour after I opened that envelope that I was telling you about earlier from the insurance company, stewing about that, wondering, oh goodness, what do I do? Evaluating, well, you know, for being as good a planner as I am, and I am a very good planner, by golly, I cannot, I'm just not savvy enough to plan when I'm going to die. I can't figure that part out. I don't get to know that. But in his graciousness, God took my memory that day while I was sitting there, setting that letter aside. He took my memory back to a certain day when I really was at death's door. And I was totally oblivious. (laughs) He wasn't oblivious. He knew exactly where I was. He was watching my every step. Even so much so that he had led me downtown to make a pastoral visit, which my schedule doesn't really permit me to do a whole lot anymore. And there I was in the Houston Medical Center where I needed to be, not just to make that pastoral visit, but because I was going to start presenting with cardio symptoms that were conspicuous. And within minutes, I would find myself in the care of Dr. Solomon, who would quickly assess my problem and saw to it that I got to where my 99.9% blocked LAD Widowmaker artery that had no more than 12 hours to last, he would later tell me, could be repaired with a stent. Oh, trust me, there's a dozen more twists and turns that I could tell you about that story that I could never make up, but just point me again and again and again to God's providential hand. And I've never forgotten one of them. So last week, holding that piece of mail, I... I just looked at the verse right here, verse 27. Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? Stop it. Stop trying to live out tomorrow before you even get there. And then he put a funny thought on my mind. The Lord did. I, I just pictured, you know, the Lord r- wringing his hands that day as if to to say, boy, I sure hope this one works out. We're cutting this one really close. I don't think so. I don't think it caught him off guard one bit because he's the father. He's God. He's in control. Even when we don't understand it, even we can't see from our side of the tapestry what's going on, he's in control. And I think that's what he wanted you to hear today, particularly that last verse, verse 33. He says, look, if you'll just keep seeking me first, not 5th, not 17th, not 53rd, not after you've done all of these things and done, why don't you just seek me first? And if you would, I'll take care of the rest for you. In my time, in my way, I always have and I always will. So when it comes to our worries about money, I think the best place to have the Lord is smack dab in the center of what's going on. The same way that the, uh, uh, the people that day when, when they only had two fish and five loaves and you remember, they, they had thousands of people who needed lunch. And, but he was smack dab in the center of it. What did he do? He multiplied it. And the masses were fed. How do you explain that? You don't explain it. Other than just to say, it's kingdom math. Jesus was in the midst of it. That's where I want him in my life. And that's where I want what I want for you.
Now, I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't just tack on one or two more thoughts briefly here at the end. Because um, as uh, confirming and assuring as I have sought to be in this message, I would not want anyone to go from here thinking that I was saying, therefore be irresponsible. Therefore, just run up your debt and get yourself all upside down because the Lord is going to take care of it. That's not what he's saying here. (laughs) And I don't think most of you would think that, but just to be clear, because I do realize there's any number of you who have gotten yourself a little upside down. And I do want you to get him right in the center of what's going on as you let him fix that. And so let me just give you a tool that, that I've given out over the years to any number of people. It was a tool that was taught to me by my father, and he says I think it came from Rockefeller um, back in the day. Not that he knew Rockefeller, but, but he, 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 he said, son, here's what I want you to do. Even when I was a kid, he was teaching me this. He said, I don't want you to live off the 100%. You need a plan. Because if you have a plan, then you'll have something you can focus on, you can work on. And... So he said, here's the plan. The first 10% you're going to give back to God. That's called the tithe. And that's just an invitation to God to get involved. Would you please get involved in my goings on here? It doesn't make sense to a lot of people when you first hear it, but it has everything to do with kingdom economics. What does kingdom economics say about the tithe? Simply this, 90% plus the blessings of God is always preferable to 100% minus the blessings of God. I want him involved. And I hope that you do as well. So my dad would say, that's the first 10%. And then the second 10%. There's any number of verses and several in Proverbs that I don't have time to look at, but, but you should save. You shouldn't get obsessive about it, but you should save and be responsible about that. He said, so that's the next 10%. And he put out little coffee cans on my dresser, and that's how he taught it to me. 10% is going back to God. 10% you'll save, and you'll only ever live off the balance. Now, some of you hear that, and you say, well, I make so much. I, I could probably give more, and I, maybe I'm saving more. Well, that's fine. But for many of you, this would be a huge step of health if you were to take it, and a huge step in alleviating your worries. The reason many of us are are, are being so torn is you have no plan to even look at. Why don't you take a plan like this and consider implementing it now? There's plenty of other people who explain these things far better and more thorough than I do. Dave Ramsey is certainly well-known. You've probably heard him on the radio, and his course is a great course. We've run it over the years off and on. There's uh, something else that we put online for you. If you'll go to faithbridge.org slash moneywise, it's an online tool that you can use, faithbridge.org slash moneywise, or you can get it from the app, and you can work through that as you... Uh, work towards health, eliminating your debt and and getting yourself uh, back the way that the Lord would have you to be stewarding the resources that he's given to you. Let me circle back and say one more thing about that tithe because that always piques people's curiosities or suspicions. Um, And and so I just want to say simply this about that whole kingdom economics, kingdom mathematics, getting him involved by saying, hey, I'm going to tithe. I'm going to give back a tenth to you. Some of you, you say, that's a tenth. That's not much. Well, great. Let that be a floor for you. And you can move beyond that in your generosity. But for many of you, that would be a huge, that would be a cross to bear. That would be a step of faith. I'm convinced, I've grown convinced over the years that there's one reason and one reason alone that people don't tithe. And in a word, it is fear. It's worry, it's anxiety, it's the stuff that keeps us up at night. That's the reason. It's all these things we've been talking about. We hold back, we say, no, 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 I can never let go of that because, oh my gosh, then everything will come unraveled. 
And he's like, wait, 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 wait. (laughs) What have we just talked about? I want you to step out in faith and see if I don't provide. See if I don't bring the same power that I brought that day at the feeding of the 5,000. I can take a little and I can multiply it if you would just have me to be a part of it. It's the fear, though, that holds many people back. And so some years ago, I issued a, a, a challenge to the congregation. I'm going to give it again today as we come towards the end. It's called the Malachi 310 challenge. Malachi 310 is a verse that says, test me in this. God says, test me in this. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse of the Lord and see then if I don't throw open the windows of heaven and pour out blessing upon blessing in your life so much that you can't even contain it all. He's saying, test me. So I said to the church, well, near 20 years ago, I said, we're going to test him in this. I want you to tithe for the next 90 days. If you're a commission worker, you bring a tenth when you make a sale. If you're a, you get a paycheck every week or two, you bring a tenth as you get your paycheck. And you do that for the next 90 days. You say, but I'm scared. You don't need to be scared. I'll tell you why. We're going to suspend a safety net underneath the tight rope. Okay? You're going to step out in faith, but you can't hurt yourself because we're going to put a a safety net under. What's the safety net look like? It looks like this. In the next 90 days, you step out and you say, I'm going to take that Malachi 310 challenge. But if the wheels start falling off, if your life starts coming unglued, if you're just like, oh my gosh, you know, and you just call the church, ask to speak to Sully, our business administrator, and he will give you every bit back that you gave. You say, isn't there a little conflict of interest? You're, you're, you're asking us to do that here. Fine. Take the challenge somewhere else. I can't give you their money back, but I can if you leave a paper trail here. So, okay, so, so what I'm saying is just put it into kingdom economics. Put it in the heavenly account and see what happens over the next 90 days. Sometimes people say when I tell them that, well, has anybody ever needed it back? Yes, four people. In all the years, four people. Three were moms and wives whose husband left the family in that stretch. And, of course, we gave them back and, and came around them with extra from our benevolence fund, as Scripture tells us to do. And then the fourth one was more recently during Harvey. Uh, a, a man, his home, it was one of the ravaged homes. And we're like, of course, we're coming back around you. Here is that plus. Four, in the better part of 20 years, by contrast, I have a file drawer, a rack full of letters and cards and notes and emails that people have sent in. You wouldn't believe what God did in these 90 days. I can't figure out, is it a coincidence or is it a God incidence? But God has blessed me. Sometimes it's financial, sometimes it's relational, sometimes it's just less fighting in the marriage. It's any number of things. As a matter of fact, here's a great story. It's a story of Megan. Megan was uh, new to town a couple of years ago, and she's a new teacher. She was living on her own, and she came here to Faith Bridge, and she said, I'll take the Malachi 310 challenge. Listen briefly, and we'll be done. I had given here and there as the offering basket came by, and given to other ministries, but not a full 10%. That seemed very scary and overwhelming to me. But I think that if it didn't make me uncomfortable to do it, that would mean it's easy and it wouldn't require faith. And I started looking at things differently. I thought, I only have a job because the Lord has given me a job and um, I'm able to work because the Lord's blessed me with health. It changed my whole mindset of How could I not give back a portion of what the Lord has given me? It it made me nervous and it it felt out of my comfort zone and I had little fears here and there pop into my head that maybe go and question and check my bank account, but the Lord was faithful and December was a tough month for me as I tithed Christmas and moving out expenses. Then New Year's Eve, my car was vandalized 
pretty bad. The whole back window was blown out. And I just remember one morning before work in January, on my knees praying and telling God the feeling that I felt, that I felt worried and that I felt anxious and I felt where am I gonna have money to pay for the damaged car and how am I gonna make it living on my own and very just a very honest conversation with God about my fears and at the end I just remember saying but I trust you and I went to school that morning and we had a staff meeting at work and they said um, our district started a new program where if you missed less than two days in this fall semester that your name is in a hat and we're going to draw a name for a winner to receive um, you know, a $1,600 bonus. And there were 24 people at our campus that met that requirement. And um, they called my name and I remember um, shaking. Other teachers jumped up and were screaming for me, but I couldn't, I couldn't move. And I started shaking because I knew right there that the Lord was saying, you're going to be okay and I'm taking care of you. And although you give and you feel that money is tight, that I'll provide for you in ways that you would never expect, but just be faithful. I've learned through this that God not only is powerful, but that he cares for me individually. When I get in the car and go to work, there's a feeling of joy that I feel that wasn't there before. Tithing is still new, and sometimes I do feel like I'm on a ledge, but when I go back to truth, I know that where the Lord has me and where He leads me is the safest place to be. Hey, that's what I want for you. I want you to take the, the, the same challenge. Text this. Here's how you do it. Take your phone out and text to 797979 uh, M310, as in Malachi 310. It'll send you the link and you can sign up today and you can just take this step the next 90 days. I will look forward to hearing more stories of the amazing things that God does when we actually surrender this aspect of our life to him. Let's pray together. Lord, thanks for the chance to come to look at your word, to uh, learn that you're not oblivious at all to any of this, but as a matter of fact, that you want to be very much involved in every aspect of it. Forgive us, Lord, for uh, assuming that we could take better care of ourselves than we can take. Lord, forgive us for that, and won't you... Um, Give us a new heart. Give us a new outlook. Give us new restored perspective and um, righted value system. Lord, I'm praying that you would do a new thing inside of us, that you would make us integrated around you, not frazzled and pulled in different directions. And for the person who is here today, who has not said yes to you in the first place, I pray, God, that even in this final moment of worship, that they would, in the quietness of this uh, hour, that they would say, Lord, today I'm stepping across the line. Jesus, I am asking you to come into my heart, to forgive me of my sins, to cleanse me from all unrighteousness, to fill me full of your spirit, to give me new purpose and new trajectory a new focus and outlook in life. And I pray all these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.